That's right. What we've seen is China react uh, by testing and, and launching live fire of missiles into the exclusive economic zones of both Taiwan and Japan. This is a threat not only to the sea lines of communication that transport over 3.3 trillion U.S. dollars in goods within the region, but also to those critical supply chains that um, are the supply chains for technology, such as semiconductors that are produced by the semi Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturing company. So this is destabilizing from the security standpoint, but from the business standpoint as well. This is a big concern to where, what are businesses going to do if this region does move into a, a much more uh, uh, unstable situation. As you said, Chinese ballistic missiles have even landed in Japan's exclusive economic zone. What has Tokyo's response been? Tokyo will double down on uh, strengthening the alliance, and we saw that today with uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi meeting with Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, talking about the importance of the alliance, talking about uh, pushing back against the uh, uh, Chinese aggressive behavior within the region. But they're not only doing this within the alliance, they're also working with the G7, as well as other partners to send the strongest of signals to both Beijing and Taipei that the status quo is in the interest of both parties, and it's in the interests of, of the world. Well, some might say that Beijing had no choice but to react to Nancy Pelosi's Taiwan visit, as it had threatened to. How concerned are Asian countries, or are they just holding out for this latest round of tensions to subside, and they're confident that it will? Well, well, this is the Indo-Pacific, and the Indo-Pacific countries are used to having two contradictory ideas, or perhaps three, uh, happening at the same time. They would like this situation to calm down as soon as possible, but at the same time, they are concerned that their biggest trading partner, China, is becoming more assertive, more aggressive, and it's using its military power to send the strongest of messages to Taiwan, as well as Japan within the region. And this is a concern because what we have is the second largest economy, China, the third largest economy on the planet, Japan. Of course, in the, uh, the 11th or 12th largest economy, South Korea, with, uh, on the planet. And this, this economic trio really drives growth within the region, but also contributes to global growth. And any kind of instability and the possibility of kinetic conflict really would disrupt growth, would disrupt this economic miracle that we've experienced for the past 40 years in the region. Meanwhile, Stephen, how has Nancy Pelosi spent her last day of her Asian tour? Well, she's been in Tokyo. She's been welcomed in Tokyo. Uh, Japan values the U.S.-Japan alliance. Uh, it, it is the cornerstone to Japanese security policy. But I think what's most important is that the U.S. visit to Taiwan has demonstrated that the United States will not be uh, cowed. It will not be cajoled. It will continue to have a strong and forward-leaning presence within the Indo-Pacific, and it will stand by partners such as Japan, South Korea, and of course, Taiwan, based on the One China policy and the Taiwanese Relation Act. And this is important for Japan, and I think it's important for the region, because they want a more anchored United States within the region. They want more diplomacy. And lastly, they want a United States that's going to economically engage within the region. So how have countries in the region viewed her trip overall? Is there consensus on how useful a visit it has been? Well, this region is very heterogeneous, so I think different countries look at uh, Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan differently. Uh, Japan, of course, sees this as an important aspect of anchoring the United States within the region and demonstrating U.S. resolve. Southeast Asians look at this as somewhat provocative, um, but also it, it is an important demonstration of the United States wanting to remain in the region, remain active in the region, and to be able to walk and chew gum. Uh, there's a conflict in Ukraine. Uh, there's challenges with China broadly. And the United States, of course, uh, has domestic instability with regards to politi its political system. And the United States coming to Taiwan at this particular time, remaining in the region, is really a demonstration that it can do many things at once. And this is the kind of the United States that I think um, Indo-Pacific countries from Singapore to Japan to South Korea to the Philippines would like to see within the region. And we've just heard that China's halting all military and climate change talks with the US. So we're seeing an effect on bilateral relations already. Yes, and this was to be expected. And I expect moving forward, what we're going to see is uh, a panoply of, 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 of pressure on the United States and its allies, whether it's cyber attack, whether it's cutting off communication on climate change and uh, dealing with piracy and other non-traditional security issues within the region, until um, I think Xi Jinping uh, 
uh, feels confident enough that it has um, that it has pushed back and sent the strongest of signals to the United States and its partners that this visit to Taiwan was unacceptable from Beijing's standpoint. I don't think this will be enough. Uh, Taiwan remains a pivotal part of the Indo-Pacific region from those sea lines of communication I mentioned, but also semiconductors, but also importantly as a democratic uh, political entity within the region, which runs counter to the Chinese narrative that uh, Chinese civilization is alien to democracy. Uh, and I think this is a really important aspect of, of Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific.